Linda McDonald. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming along. Uh, my name is Lewis. I'm a uh, research fellow up at the University of Leicester, although I commute from North London um, up to Leicester every day. And I completed my PhD a couple of years ago, uh, just down the road at University College London at UCL. And the field of my actual research, my, my day job in the science labs, is in a new field of research, a new field of science called astrobiology, which is all about looking at the possibility of there being life beyond the Earth. So I come from a biological background, and the last couple of years I've learned an enormous amount of kind of planetary science uh, and particle physics and computer modelling and the kind of mathematical analysis techniques uh, to look into the, the big question about whether there's life out there, if there's perhaps bacterial life on the surface of Mars. And what I've been thinking about for the last two years for this new project, the, the kind of hobby I've been doing along the side, uh, for this new book, The Knowledge, How to Rebuild a World from Scratch, uh, is on something completely different. I've gone from uh, the science and helping the hunt for aliens to talking about how you might reboot civilization from scratch. Um, and this is, this is the, the starting point of a thought experiment. So let, let's say that this has happened. There's been some kind, of, some kind of global catastrophe, some kind of doomsday event, some kind of apocalypse. And you've woken up, uh, let's say, with a hangover the morning after, the day before, the day when the world as we know it has ended. And you've kind of picked yourself up from, from the rubble and dusted off, dusted off the dust, dusted yourself off. And you've fallen in with a crowd of, of other survivors. You're in a, in a kind of post-apocalyptic world with a community of survivors. And this is the kind of trope that I think we're all pretty familiar with already. This has been in plenty of cinema films and kind of sci-fi novels from I Am Legend to The Road or The Death of Grass. There's a, there's a good kind of history to this kind of post-apocalyptic narrative. But the question that I've been trying to ask is, is what do you do next? What happens now? How can you pick yourself up right from the basics, from the very fundamentals, and rebuild a technological civilization from the ground up? What kind of stuff do you need? What, what kind of fundamental processes and principles would you need to know? What would you want to have condensed down into a single book that you'd want to have handed to you in this post-apocalyptic world that told you how to rebuild, how, how to reboot a civilization? Uh, and the conceit is that that's the book in your lap right now, that the knowledge is this single tome that tells you how to redo or uh, rebuild all the functions of a modern civilization, of a technological civilization. And the reason I wrote this is, firstly, I, I was fascinated by it. I think it's an interesting thought experiment to go through. But I think it's also quite relevant and, and perhaps topical, especially right now, because I get the sense that all of us in the modern world today have this, this kind of feeling of, of, of disconnect, that we don't really have that much of a, of, a, of a real sense, a real understanding, and certainly no kind of hands-on practical experience of how a lot of stuff is, is really done, or how things are made in the modern world today. And if you really had to, let's say if you're in this post-apocalyptic scenario, if you're knocked back to first principles, do any of us really have the foggiest idea how to take a handful of seed and walk out into a muddy field and make food come out of that field? How do you, how do you reinstate agriculture? What are the fundamental principles you need to, to know to, to reinstate farming? Because it is not as simple as you might think. Farming is a, is a ludicrously artificial process you have to go through. Even though plants grow naturally, it is not in natural, nature's um, best interest, if you like, to have a monoculture of all the same crops growing in very high density, all in the same place, and not have it hit by disease or by pathogens or pests or something. You're, you're trying to rigorously control the ecology of a, of a farm or a field uh, to grow food for yourself. So, so how do you do that? How do you get metal out of rocks? How do you make the materials that we rely upon today? If you kind of reach into your pocket now, there'll probably be a combination of, of metals and plastics and, and perhaps some glass. How, how do you make that for yourself? How do you dig raw substances, base substances out of the ground and then process them or transform them into the materials which are most useful? How do you go from a raw material to something which is useful, that, has, that we can use for a function. Um, and this is, this is what I've been trying to talk about. This is the, the research I've been doing for knowledge and, and trying to piece together, chapter by chapter, these different themes of, of, of communication technologies and transport technologies and, and me mechanisms and, and substances and chemicals. And the very beginning of the book is playing around with this idea uh, of what I call the grace period. Because if there were to be some kind of uh, let's say that the best possible way 
for the world to end. It would not be an asteroid strike or a nuclear war, but because it would leave the world in, in, in tatters. You'd, you'd find devastation around you, and it would be very, very hard to reinstate farming when the fields themselves are poisoned, when there's radioactivity from, from the fallout. So the, the starting point for the thought experiment that I picked up on, that the best possible way for the world to end, was some kind of viral pandemic, perhaps something like avian flu or swine flu, that spreads incredibly quickly the, with our high-density urban lifestyles today and intercontinental flights and, and transmission of diseases very, very readily. And it wipes out 99.99% of the world's population. So the people have gone, and there's only a small community of survivors left. But the stuff is still all here. You can still go and scavenge in a city and get the kind of glass and the metal and the timber and stuff you need to repurpose and rejig and, and jury rig stuff to, to keep yourself going. So the first chapter of the book is talking about this grace period, how you get this, this buffer zone, if you like, where you get a, a couple of years, perhaps, maybe a couple of decades, maybe a generation, to work things out for yourself, to go through this process of trial and error before it becomes a matter of life and death to, to grow food for yourself. And one of the calculations that I, I sat down and, and scratched my head um, was, a, was a kind of sub-thought experiment, if you like. If you were to be locked in an average supermarket uh, with, with fresh water, unlimited fresh water, and a way of disposing of, of your, your waste, so kind of sanitary conditions, how long could you survive in an average supermarket before you starve to death? How long would the food in a supermarket sustain you for? And so clearly you'd want to uh, plan, play some kind of optimal strategy. You eat the fresh fruit and red veg first, because they'll go off in a couple of, of days, perhaps a week or two. You could then move on to the dried pasta and the rice, uh, which have a persistence time of, of several months to years. And that the largest reserve of preserved food would clearly be tin cans, would be canned food. So I went around an average supermarket, uh, which was the one in Angel, Islington, um, and I noted down and counted up and kind of multiplied up all the food that was in there and knowing the persistence times of each category of, of, of food and worked out that you could support yourself 55 years living on, on the sustenance just in a single supermarket. Uh, and that would be, go up to 63 years if you don't mind eating the cat food and the dog food. <laughs> so so you've, you've got time to play with. If you multiply that up to the society as a whole, to the uh, stored sustenance of the, of the United Kingdom, the nation as a whole, for a small community of perhaps several thousand, maybe a few tens of thousands of people, you've got decades before that food would run out and you have to work out um, the, the principles of farming to keep yourself going. Water, of course, is going to be another primary consideration for you. And again, it's by repurposing uh, everyday substances you can scavenge from the dead cities, the abandoned cities. You can purify water very, very adequately using something like kitchen bleach uh, or swimming pool chlorine, so sodium hypochlorite and calcium hypochlorite, and you just dilute them enough, and then this is exactly the compounds that you use in the, in the public water supply to purify water for you. Or even more simply than that, all you need is an empty plastic bottle, like this one here, and you fill it with water and leave it in the sun. And then there's a process called solar disinfection, or SODIS, which is recommended by the WHO, by the World Health Organization in the Third World, as, as a tried and tested method for purifying drinking water for the very you know, simple and fundamental reason that the last thing you want to catch in a world of antibiotics is a really simple infection that you could have prevented by just having your wits about you and being aware of germ theory and kind of basic hygiene. So you can use SODIS to purify drinking water for yourself by, by just scavenging some empty plastic bottles. And you want to keep um, an electrified lifestyle going for you. This is a, a car alternator that you can, you can rip out the bonnet of a car and jury rig into some kind of windmill or water wheel, turn the spindle, and regardless of what speed you turn that spindle, you generate 12 volts uh, across the tunnels and you can recharge uh, deep cycle batteries, which you can scavenge from things like golf buggies or uh, yachts or kind of RVs or caravans. They're the best kind of battery for, for storing power long term. Okay compared to a car engine. And what I keep trying to do in the book is come back to real examples in our own history where similar scenarios have occurred. And this is a city called uh, Gorazda, which was cut off in the Bosnian-Serbian War by the Bosnian army. And they had food drops and medic medical drops from the Red Cross, but they were completely isolated from the national grid, from power grid. They had no electricity. And so they jury, they bodged and created these water wheels for themselves, uh, using scavenged car alternators 
with these wheels turning the current um, from these platforms they tethered to a bridge. So a lot of this, you, you can root back down into real examples. This isn't just speculation and arm waving for the, for the sake of it. There's some really great examples. And I, I come back to POW camps a couple of times where people have bodged stuff together, things they can scavenge from around them. If you want to keep your cars going um, after the diesel and petrol has run out, there's a process <laughs> known as gasification. Um, and I've got a, a very short video to show you in a second. Uh, but this is my gasifier stove that I made for myself uh, for this video that's up on YouTube and on, on the books website as well. And this is, again, ludicrously simple. It's just a big outer tin can with some holes around the bottom, a smaller tin can in the middle, again with some holes at the bottom. And when you put your fuel, your kind of uh, bits of wood in there, the holes at the bottom draw in through the air and the oxygen, and it burns uh, nice and intensely. But that's kind of what we're familiar with from any barbecue. What's novel about these gasifier stoves is you have a ring of holes at the top as well, and that draws in fresh oxygen, which meets, is reintroduced into the hot gases, the vapour and the smoke, which is itself combustible, is remixed with oxygen, and you get secondary combustion. So it's a very, very efficient way of using the fuel um, in the stove. And I've got, as I say, a very short video to show you that process. Let's get this fired up, set work. I'll it up with some simple chemicals. And if you think that's a massive cheat, the previous video to this is how you can use things other than lighters and matches to start a fire if you can't scavenge those. And you can use something like a fire alarm to start a fire with, or a bottle of water to start a fire with. That's why I didn't do the demo for real, for real in, the, in the room. You are ready. That's roaring away with the air and oxygen being drawn up. So I get that going nice and intensely. Burning down that fuel. If I take off, it's going on. It's also called a rocket stove, perhaps for obvious reasons. If I take off, that's blue. So, so this is just from a, a small handful of twigs, and very, very little fuel in it. Now look, you can see that upper ring of air holes, there are jets of flame coming out there. The oxygen is being drawn in and igniting all those producer gases coming off from the wood. It's coming those pyrolysis and gives off the vapor and the gas. And the smoke itself is combustible. So it's burning all that. It's a very, very efficient way of using the fuel. Do I recommend it's not already? Uh, and then I cook some custard, uh, which, which I'd opened in one of the previous videos. And the reason this is important is it allows you to build a gasify stove, but that was more for the process of, of demonstration. But you can also do amazing stuff like this. <laughs> this is a gasifier-powered car. This is a wood-powered car. And you basically have the stove strapped in a, in a big dustbin on the back. This is where you, uh, you drive that process of pyrolysis. You use the heat of combustion to break down the complex uh, molecules of the wood release those producer gases and the vapours, which you then simply just pipe uh, down into the cylinders of your engine, um, mix with oxygen, as would happen with your carburetor anyway, and, and then drive your car based on wood rather than liquid fuels, rather than fossil fuels. So this is the kind of technology, and again, this is done very, very uh, commonly in the Second World War, over a million gasified vehicles in the Second World War. Um, the German army even had a division of panzer tanks that were <laughs> wood-powered, that were driven by these things strapped to the back of them. Um, because they were facing such acute fuel shortages towards the end of the war. So it's this kind of technology or kind of resurrection of historical techniques that you can use to keep yourself going in the grace period after the apocalypse. But more interestingly, um, for myself as a scientist, was this thought experiment, this process of thinking how you could reboot um, civilization from scratch, how you would actually go through the process of rebuilding everything um, from, as I said, the kind of the agriculture and the transport technologies and the communication technologies and the, and the materials and the substances that all of our lives rely upon. And um, as I said, we don't really have any direct sense of how that works. And so clearly agriculture and being able to feed yourself is one of the, the key fundamentals. Uh, these are the cereal crops. Um, all humanity eats grass. The cereal crops are all species of grass. And if you don't eat wheat directly, you're eating something that's been fed the grain um, and then given you a steak. So we all all eat grass. 
These three crops here, the wheat, rice, and maize, have supported civilizations throughout human history of, of the um, European, North American, <coughs> sorry, European, Asian, and North American civilizations have all been founded on those three staple crops. Um, and in the book, there's a map uh, of how to find the Millennium Seed Bank. We can rescue heirloom uh, grain, so seed corn, to, to reboot agriculture if you can't find anything in the fields because it's been too long. Um, given with latitude and longitude coordinates, and explains later in the book how you can um, reinvent those, how you can find out exactly where this place is in the world. You need technology, you need mechanisms um, to harvest that grain for you. And one of the major features of, of the history of, of civilization has been the application of power and mechanisms and harnessing natural power sources like water or wind in this example to relieve civilization from having to use you know, your own muscles, from having to go out into the field yourself or grind grain into flour with just a pestle and mortar. And so the key component of this windmill here these millstones at the bottom, which ground, grind the grain into flour, which you then make bread out of and can consume that nutrition from the grass that you've harvested. So in a sense, then, these millstones are a technological invent, uh, extension of your molar teeth, the way we've invented to um, push beyond the limitations of our human body and, and use technology to enhance it, those millstones there. Pottery and being able to cook food and ferment food is an extension of our stomachs. We've basically invented uh, external digestive systems. There's a whole, whole load of similar examples. And it's not just mechanisms you need to, to be able to reinvent and, and reboot. Um, the, the kind of poster boy of the Industrial Revolution was the steam engine and these kind of um, big bits of machinery and then the kind of fire and the power behind it all. But just as importantly, there's been the application of, of chemistry, of creating the, the substances needed to support civilization, things like soda uh, or nitrates for your fields. And this example here, again, goes back to the kind of gasifier stove and the uses of wood, where if you warm the wood, it starts breaking down and gives off all these very, very useful compounds. And before the 1900s, um, and the application of coal and then crude oil is the, the kind of feedstock for petrochemicals and everything that feeds into the chemical industry today, it was all timber-based. And so this is the kind of more rudimentary basis you need to drop back down to, um, to leapfrog to, and then start recovering your capabilities. Um, I want to show just two other um, pictures, slightly more egotistical. Because um, a lot of fun with researching this book and writing it, clearly wasn't just sat down in the library or at home um, reading text and digesting information. It was doing things for real and getting kind of hands-on expertise. Um, and this is a day spent in a 1700s blacksmith working by a, a coke-fired hearth with kind of bellows pumping away, uh, getting bits of metal to be red hot and then hammering the life out of them on, a, on an anvil with, with a big blacksmith's hammer. And I created uh, a steel knife for myself from scratch. I, I, I transformed a blank of steel into a knife, which I then very smugly, very gleefully took home and cut some bread and some cheddar and made myself a post-apocalyptic cheese toasty <laughs> from scratch. Uh, and then discovered immediately afterwards a, a ruinous crack in, in the handle of my knife that I made from scratch. I'd, I'd done a, a, a pretty awful job. <laughs> but with the point behind this though is that I now know how to go back and try again and do better. It's that process of kind of reiteration on, on a microcosm with me making a, a knife for myself, a tool from scratch. It's the exact same process that civilization has gone from, gone through over thousands of years. And you want to have some kind of um, effort at least accelerating that process to perhaps just couple of generations or a couple of centuries. Um, and if you look on the inside cover of the books in your laps, I was really keen for the author photo to not just be a, a kind of digital photo that we kind of snapped and chucked into Photoshop and, and, and printed. Um, this is a photo we made from scratch. Um, I went to uh, the Fox Talbot Museum where photography was invented back in the 1840s, 1830s, 1840s. And we mixed up the silver chemistry ourselves. We made these compounds from scratch, doped them onto a plate of glass exposed in a, in a very rudimentary camera with just a single lens at the front uh, for a 16 second exposure. It is ludicrously hard to hold something that doesn't look like a death grimace <laughs> for 16 seconds without blurring. Um, and what you can't see is behind my back, there is a, an honestly got a metal brace that clamps into the base of your skull to hold your head as still as possible so it doesn't blur during this, this very, very long exposure. Um, and that's the reason why most photos of kind of, you know, Edwardian gentlemen and Victorian gentlemen, they look so funless and, and joyless. 
because they're standing still, <laughs> sitting still for 15 seconds with a metal clamp behind them. And the other interesting thing to point out, the, the very simple chemistry we used here is much more sensitive to ultraviolet radiation, UV rays from the sun, from the visible light. So this isn't actually what your eyes would see. It's slightly distorted. And your lips come out as being very white, very pale, because they reflect a lot of UV. And you're actually seeing into a deeper layer of your skin, the kind of into the, into the dermis, which is why it looks a bit more blotchy uh, and dark. Um, but I was quite chuffed to be able to, as I create a photo for myself and of myself for the back page um, of the book. Um, there's a website linked into the knowledge as well um, with a whole load of, of kind of content and the videos that we created that I've mentioned already. Uh, this is a video about how to start fire using only things from an Ikea shop um, and creating a fire bow out of one of their, their coat hangers that I've um, found from someone else and, and uploaded. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've enjoyed these last two years. And the conceit, at least, is that this is the one tome, the one book you would need to reboot civilization from scratch with all these different functions of the modern world that you would need to recreate. Um, as I said, there's the website you can explore for um, a little bit more, more information and detail, and a Twitter stream as well. Uh, but I didn't want to drone on too long. I thought I'd just say some things for 15, 20 minutes and introduce a bit about what the book goes on about. Um, but for me, the most interesting thing is, is talking to me about it and, and hearing your ideas, what would be the most crucial information you would want to preserve if there were to be some kind of apocalyptic scenario and you have to go right back from scratch. What would be the, the crucial information that you'd want to have handed to you? Um, so thank you guys for listening. Um, I see we do have some time for questions or discussion or chat. Thank you very much. Cheers. I have a microphone. Does anyone have any questions? Right at the back. Thank you. It was very, very interesting. Um, so one of the, the, the questions was that, um, so all that, uh, that knowledge and how to do all those things right now is preserved on things like YouTube, right? And, and digital books and things like that. Uh, how can we make sure that we don't lose that knowledge so that we can actually you know, do those things, you know, when we, when we get to that day. Well, a, a very similar problem was encountered um, in the latter half of, of the 1700s when the very first encyclopedias were being compiled uh, by people like Dennis Diderot. And, th and they came across a, a very similar problem. How can you explain practical skills like weaving or making nets or, or, or harvesting, bringing in a, a harvest in, in a field? How can you explain these kind of very practical skills that you learn over the course of many years working with someone who already knows how to do it and showing you and correcting you if you're doing it wrong? How can you communicate and then condense that into just words in an encyclopedia or perhaps just some, some diagrams? And the, the only encyclopedia um, compilers, and there's a, there's a blog post on exactly this on the website, um, they were acutely aware, perhaps even more so than we are today, of just how fragile and vulnerable civilizations are. You know, the, the Roman Empire collapsed, the Greek civilization collapsed, the Mayans and Incans, um, which we've discovered subsequently, have all collapsed. Um, so what could you do to preserve the sum total of human knowledge? And they, they made genuine attempts to record everything back then. We, we, we know a bit more nowadays, so that would be perhaps impossible. And even something like Wikipedia doesn't even come close. Um, so th the conceit, the, the kind of cheeky answer, if you like, um, up on the website is you would get uh, an iPad or another kind of tablet. You would jury rig with a uh, solar panel or an alternator from a car to, to regenerate power for yourself and recharge your batteries. And you would download some of the apps I recommend where you can rip off, scoop off videos from YouTube and save them on the hard disk of, of your tablet. So when the internet goes down, which will happen very, very quickly after the apocalypse, you've still got the, not just the words of the knowledge book, but also these kind of demo videos. Um, stored for, for prosperity, as it were. <clears throat> well, I was just going to ask, do you think we might have been in a better position to uh, reinvent a site maybe 100 years ago before the internet? Because the internet makes people's minds lazy and you don't have to know stuff because you can look it up on the internet. And so, therefore, that's how s civilization spread early, orally being passed down from generation to generation, skills, stories, mythologies, etc. Yeah, my, my gut reaction, my impression is that we'd probably be worse off today than a century ago if, if this hypothetical scenario were to happen, if you did have to go back to scratch. Because um, even during the Second World War, like I said, there's an enormous amount of ingenuity and in kind of problem solving during the, the kind of scarcity of the Second World War. And most people had allotments in the back garden. They grew stuff themselves. They grew vegetables and food to feed themselves. How many of us do that today? 
you know, there's perhaps not that many hipsters in London that have even got access mm -hmm. to an allotment to be able to grow. And I did try when I was living down in Angel um, to get an allotment for myself, and there was something like a nine-year waiting list. So, so a lot of these skills are, are just are, are dissolving away. They're disappearing. Um, you don't... You don't repair things for yourself anymore. You, you can't kind of get your, your, your radio and kind of take out the valve that isn't working anymore and can replace it. You can't look and understand the mechanism of the things we use because, you know, your iPhone, the, the mechanism inside that is, is literally visibly small. You need a microscope to be able to see the kind of city landscape of, of the circuitry there. And, and it's not something you could ever repair for yourself. And in fact, you're not even expected to take the back off technology nowadays. You just take it back to the shop and a genius will repair it for you. Um, and I think that's sad. I think it's lamentable that we're kind of losing that connection with how things are, are made or done in a fundamental sense. Thanks. Um, really interesting talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, two related questions. As you went through all of your research for this, um, and you were focusing on things that, that we were missing, were there any kind of objects or, or processes that you thought, you know what, actually we could just forget that? And, and kind of related to that, are there any kind of social constructs that, that you sort of came across that you thought, you know, how, how would we implement uh, law or yeah. government or whatever it is? Yeah, so two very good questions. Um, one of the recurring themes I tried to keep coming back to through the book was this this network, this web of scientific discoveries which enable you to make new technological innovations which then allow you to investigate the world in a new way and, and make new scientific discoveries. That kind of back and forth process between science and technology and exploring this vast web of knowledge we have today. So for example, mastering the substance of glass and grinding it into a lens to build a, a microscope which allows you to explore the invisible realm. But with hindsight, we now know red herrings we took in the history of science and technology, or stuff that turned out to be not all that very useful, or things like electricity that are so useful in so many different ways, you want to beeline directly to that gateway technology, as I call it, and it kind of opens up a whole load of other stuff. Uh, so there's a video about electrolysis on the website, about how you can use electricity, electricity not just for power and, and moving things with motors for you, but generating crucial substances uh, like bleach or kind of chlorine and things. So you want to leapfrog something like electro electricity and the printing press for similar reasons and also the kind of social ramifications of that. But it being a popular science book and it already been quite difficult to fit all the scientific knowledge into just 300 pages, one of the early decisions, one of the early editorial decisions was to leave out more of the social sciences, the, the kind of politics and economics and, 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 and you know, a description of how to build a democracy from scratch. Because although undeniably important, I think there is a clear distinction between you know, kind of art and music and, and, and politics and science, and that science is universal. The laws will be true no matter where you are or when you are. Humanity will have the same requirements and demands that technology must provide for. So science and technology, in a sense, are universal. But politics isn't, isn't really. And, and my suspicion was if I wrote this twee little 10-step guide to building a parliamentary democracy, it doesn't matter because whoever's got the biggest gun gets to be the boss anyway. And they're not going to relinquish the power unless you go through perhaps 100, 200 years of kind of social revolution and, and kind of slow change. So you can provide key kernels or principles of science, but you can't really do the same thing for, for, for kind of social constructs. I think they have to arise organically or naturally. And it probably wouldn't make that much difference if you described democracy because it would <laughs> no one pay any attention unless they're ready for it anyway. You'd perhaps live with a kind of feudal system for you know, 50 years or whatever. So thanks for uh, presenting and thanks for the book. I've been waiting for something like this since I discovered science fiction because <laughs> you know all these post-apocalyptic scenarios. It's good to know that now we know how to uh, fend for ourselves. Personal question for you: If the apocalypse, in the way you described, came and 99.99% of the population was decimated. Uh, beyond sort of locking yourself up in a supermarket for food and water for the next 55 years, what would be your personal kind of next steps? Uh, medicine, go and find the biggest gun, something else? Yeah, so th there's been a bunch of reviews on, on the Amazon US site. 
And there's been inevitably a bunch of preppers who have reviewed this book about rebooting civilization, and they just love their guns. And one of the major criticisms is, you haven't talked about weaponry in your book. And of course <laughs> it's true. But again, the, the resounding bottom line is, if you've got a gun, you're fine. If you don't have a gun, find one. It's not an interesting discussion. There's no interesting answer to be had there. And the knowledge isn't going to help you either way. So I avoided guns right from the beginning, um, for the same reason I avoid kind of politics and stuff. But clearly, for, for this book to be relevant, you have to be in a world that isn't like the road. You have to be kind of beyond that stage. This is what happens next. And you have got this some semblance of a stable society where people are now ready to start progressing and, and rebuilding, as happened in the 1340s after the bubonic plague and, and the Black Death. A lot of people died. People shrugged their shoulders, stiff upper lip, and, and kind of got on with it. Um, so the, the, the next step, the, the one piece of information that I think would be most critical out of all knowledge that you would really want to preserve and not forget, um, I've hinted that already, is this kind of idea of germ theory and hygiene. There is nothing you can do more for yourself to keep yourself healthy and alive than stopping yourself picking up a, a, a transmissible infection in the first place. And the kind of basic tenets of germ theory and hygiene will really help you out there when there aren't antibiotics anymore. So without being too prurient, make sure you're not drinking your own excrement making sure no one else is putting excrement into the river where you're taking your water from. And you laugh now, and this is obviously a disgusting thing. As late as the 1850s, 1860s, that's what happened in London, the capital of the most powerful empire in, in the world. They were pouring their poo into the River Thames, and someone else 20 yards down the road down the river was putting up a bucket and, and drinking it. And tens of thousands of people would be dying in a week with cholera for, for really easily preventable ways. So one of the key technologies to talk about is how to make a microscope ludicrously simple to prove to yourself that there are these organisms that are too small to see that cause disease, and you want to break that, that cycle um, with things like hygiene. It, it kind of demonstrates scientifically, with, you know, with evidence, why this is important. Um, lovely. I think Rob is going to drag me onto the tube yeah, to, we're go to, Bell to your other main site. Uh, so please uh, join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Thank uh, you, guys. Gone.